I've worked in construction for 40 years. I am and always will be Lee Una. Construction is one of the most stable industries in today's economy. There's plenty of opportunity, so come and learn at the Layuna Local 183 Training Center. It's the right place to start. If you're thinking about your future, you can learn a skilled trade through hands-on training and classroom training. Layuna Local 183 Training Center is excellence in training. All apprenticeship programs are registered with the Ontario Ministry of Training Colleges and Universities. Become an apprentice and learn new skills which will open the doors to a rewarding career. Visit 183training.com. I just started my training and I am Liuna. Now I think it's my turn. Thank you so much. <coughs> yes, it's your turn. Mr. Richard, we are very happy to see you here between us, among us, and we are talking uh, freely to you. And same thing that you are talking freely to us too. As uh, next prime minister, hopefully that you will be. Apparently, it's the done deal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no question. You will yeah, be. Of you will be. Talk after that. <laughs> so, uh, my name is Madlou Morogi. I am the Iraqi minorities group components group uh, in Canada, the leader. And uh, you know, in uh, summer 2014, the ISIS invaded, uh, you know, Nineveh plains and Jar, you know, like Yazidis people, uh, Iraqi Christians people, Chaldean, Syriac, Assyrian, those are components. And uh, Kakayan, Mandayan people, and with Kurdish people too, in Nineveh Plain. Nineveh Plain, it's between Kurdistan region and, uh, and like Mosul or Arab region. So in summer 2014, when they invaded, they, uh, they got Sinjar, they got Mosul. And Mosul, it is the second city in Iraq as population yeah. and, uh, you know, uh, so and so. So they, we had around, around <coughs> 100,000 people, Christians people and, and other components. They threatened them to be like, to convert to Islam or, or pay the non-Muslim non taxes or leave. So there were around 40, 50, or 60 kilometers between, between Mosul and uh, Duhok, Erbil, the Kurdistan region. So many of them, they were walking. They walked from Mosul to Duhok and to Erbil. Anyway, and let me express my special thanks to Kurdistan region government that they, they opened their doors to our people, and they help them, like for food and clothes and tents and uh, you know management, everything were there ready for them. And uh, when when we went, I got you know delegation or high delegation of uh, three MPs with uh, Smada was with us and. Uh, you know, we went there, we visited uh, many camps there. And at the, the end of our, our visit, I told uh, Brad Butt, maybe you know him, he was a uh, member of parliament at that time. So I told him, oh, Brad, what would you do? He said, when, uh, when we 
arrived Canada, Toronto, I will go direct to Harper. He was prime minister. And I told him the story, everything. After three days, Mr. Harper and uh, Jason Kenney was uh, defense minister. So they visited Kurdistan with, uh, you know, and they sent the first, first thing they sent around 10 to 20 million dollars, just uh, eight, you know, uh, with food and uh, clothes and uh, medicine to, to Kurdistan region government. So, and now still we have around 50 to 60,000 people uh, in Kurdistan and we have 50, 60, 70,000 people in neighboring country, Turkey and uh, Lebanon, Jordan. Anyway, but at that time, that when we were, when uh, Harper was the prime minister, brought around 20 to 30,000 people. Second round. <laughs> 20 to, 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 to 30,000 30, people, they, question, he brought it to Canada. So what's your plan about Thank about you. our people. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. Sorry. Uh, again, uh, you, you brought something, uh, the, the fact that uh, Christians are, uh, you know, persecuted across uh, the world. You know, these days we, we hear a lot about that. I think Canada needs to take a stand about that. It's not <coughs> the fact that they have to defend Christianity. It's, it's mainly to defend uh, freedom of, of religion, expression. Religious freedom. Uh, freedom of, for the people in, at large. If Canada is seen, and it used to be seen uh, from that part, I think if we have our uh, defending those values, uh, that will put pressure on itself uh, on other countries. Uh, I think it's very important that we talk about it, first of all. Recognize the fact that there's a problem there. And it's not only there that there's uh, persecution about uh, Christians, and I think we need to address that precisely, you know, and that, that would be part of uh, our presentation, why not be prime minister? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, it's my turn. Go ahead. Mine or yours? You want me to, no, to count the minutes? <laughs> 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 yeah, okay, I'll count the minutes for you, for sure. Uh, yeah, you count so sure. my question is, uh, when Mr. Harper came to power, the first thing he did was cutting off funds for research. He cut uh, yeah, cut budget for libraries. Many, many libraries shut down. Research, and this country is research-based country. We depend on research for whatever policy we design. This is this is something I want to know, Mr. Richard, when he comes to the Prime of Canada, will he do the same, or he stands out as a unique conservative? Because conservatives, based, because we could, could have many, many angles. He could be. Conservative, but still defends gay and lesbian strong. Don't think so, but uh, it could be. Yeah. So it's this not, is my question. Yeah. This is my question. Uh, new conservative would say the same. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe agree with me. But uh, this is one question. Another question is. Uh, another question is. Uh, uh, how how would you shift this country based on what you said in one of the interviews more towards right where where uh, how do you say it? where uh, the public this country is very very open minded country this country is the first country to raise the 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 the, the, the same sex marriage flags on the on the hill of the parliament uh, how 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 canada would 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 uh, would tolerate that? To 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 I don't know if you're if you're getting if you're getting if you're getting uh, motivation for, 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 for protectionism. Uh, like protecting Canada's boundaries is very very important. I totally agree with you. But at the same time, this country is built oh. on the shoulders of immigrants. Mm -hmm. That's my question. That's protect. And one more question: What is your stand oh, for sorry, indigenous sorry. people? <laughs> no. no. I have three questions. Are you going to be same as Mr. Harper? Uh, uh, like, where do you take the country towards right? Uh, forget about Trump, and your stand on indigenous people. Indigenous people. Yeah. First of all, uh, 
I have Thank to you. make a confession here. I worked with Stephen Harper, and I was very impressed uh, and uh, privileged to work with him. But I didn't agree on, on everything that he was uh, presenting, as you may understand. So when he uh, made the cuts in research, I thought that it was a mistake, personally. Uh, I think it's very important that uh, we uh, not only encourage, but finance what needs, what, what could bring this country a little bit uh, bigger and higher. And sometimes the private sector cannot do some certain things that the government needs to invest in. And I think uh, uh, research and intelligence uh, with, the, uh, with the sense of improving our knowledge about things, especially in science, is very important. I don't know the details of uh, what motivated this decision at that time, but at that time I remember that I didn't agree with that. And that's the kind of conservatism, I think, that could be seen as a fiscal conservatism, where we cut budgets, but we don't look at the impact. We see that in business a lot. I've uh, been involved, like I said before, with customers. And when you cut service to customers, sometimes you lose the customer. So you, th you think you're having uh, a budget cut, but you're, in fact, you're uh, diminishing your, your sales because your customers are not happy. So that, that's a, a thing that we have to keep, keep in mind. Before we make that kind of decision, we need to uh, understand what will be the implication. Uh, the second question was, <laughs> right, you're taking, you're taking more right. right. Yeah. Like I said before, it's a question of having principal uh, government. Uh, personally, I think the left is uh, saying a lot of things, but doing very small uh, things compared to what they, 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 uh, they are expressing. If you look presently at uh, Mr. Uh, Bernie Sanders in the United States, this guy is a socialist, almost a communist. He talks about abortion like if it was the, the first uh, thing in, in the world that would be good for the country until uh, the baby is born. For me, that's a good example of uh, it's all talks, and when the reality comes, it makes no sense. And we've seen that in many countries. So being on the left for the Liberal Party is to say a lot of things and do the opposite once you're elected. I want to change that also because if I'm involved in politics, I want to make sure that people are having hope about the fact that we have politicians who can do what they said and say what, they, what they're going to be doing. And once you've done that, you're showing to, to the young uh, generation that maybe there's a potential in this country. If not, where's the hope? The hope. And people won't be voting and then we have hierarchy. And I think the Liberals are bringing us uh, very uh, fastly uh, on that, uh, <coughs> that road. So personally, I would change that the best I can with the, the mean I have. Indigenous people? Indigenous people? I think it, it's important that, and, and it's interesting because we, we came out very strongly about the fact that there was blockade in the past uh, weeks. Uh, I was one of the first candidates to take a stand about that, but saying that it makes no sense. If I, if I decide to make a blockade myself, in five minutes, I'm in prison. So how come when it's indigenous uh, people, it's different treatment? And especially what the liberals have been doing for 20 days, waiting for waiting for what? We don't understand because the economy is in jeopardy and a lot of things is in jeopardy. That being said, the problem with indigenous people is much deeper than what we're seeing. They're not doing that for nothing. And the Indian Act is one of the problems, personally, that I think it's an, it's an old legislation, uh, beginning of the 20th century, that is kept that way because nobody wants to talk about that. So I think a responsible government needs to address those situations before we get a crisis like we have now. And in Quebec, we've been served with that. We had a crisis in Oka 30 years ago where the, the, the place was paralyzed. There was uh, policeman that was killed. So when I saw what was happening yesterday morning uh, at one of the blockades, I thought that the policemen were like taking a big risk doing what they did compared to what we had experienced. And we see that there's a lot of action uh, taking uh, across Canada, but at the same time, the liberals, the way they are uh, reacting to this, uh, those blockades, they are giving a lot of power to criminals. Even though they, they are indigenous or others, doesn't change what it is. You know, we are in a, 
in a country where the law is, has to be applied to everybody. We are e all equal in front of the law. It's not the case with those people. I don't think it's, it's fair. And at the same time, if they are not treated well because of the, that Indian Act, we should act on the Indian Act before we get the problems eventually. So that would be part of my, uh, my government to look into this uh, situation and try to find solutions, permanent solutions, for the best of the people. Asiakam, you're going to give her priority because she hasn't talked. Okay, <laughs> forgive us. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Uh, my question about when you become a prime minister, mm -hmm. cost of living in this country is very dramatic. Like you see people, especially newcomers coming, they get probably fifteen hundred dollars a month. Uh, how they can pay rent? How can they eat? How can they travel with it? How can they raise kids? These are all um, big issue, and also the price of uh, a housing. It's sky uh, hard. So these are big issues. Uh, for instance, I have a place, I have to live with my, my son is 27 years old, has to live with me because to support me to pay my mortgage. If he moved out, he has to go on on his life. What will happen to me? If I can't pay my mortgage, then I will lose my house. What you would do, uh, would you be able to set a minimum annually salary for everybody to live comfortably, to not go to the food banks? to not struggle to be on the street, to not uh, go for the drug on all these things. So that's my question. Personally, I don't think the government should be uh, taking care of everybody. You know, <laughs> we need, we need yeah. to be autonomous in life, and we encourage freedom for that. You know, We need to work. We need to be, uh, to be uh, taking charge of our responsibility. So every time that the government tries to uh, take care of everybody, the, the result is very dramatic. We, we've seen that in communist countries. Uh, that being said, I think we have a lot of, uh, of uh, action that could be taken between the three levels of government, because what you're referring to touches municipal affairs, provincial, and federal. And most of the time, what we're seeing is interaction between those three levels that are inefficient. And sometimes the people that are in need are not receiving what they should be receiving. So personally, I think by <coughs> giving more power to provinces from the federal level, the federal should be taking care of certain things. And what you're referring to goes back to provinces and municipal affairs. Then they could work together much better if they have the money to, to invest. Because uh, what we're, we're talking about is housing and also the, the cost of living that is very different from one city to the other, from one province to the other. So it would be very hard for a federal government to have a policy coast to coast that would be uh, respecting all the needs of the province. The cost of living in Vancouver is much different from Montreal. So we, have, we need to address it uh, that way. Thank you. Definitely. Uh, no, I'm going to take uh, over for it. So. <laughs> short? No, no very short. Point very short. Book, please. No, no. I have to talk to the English. That's OK. I am talking to Kurdish English. <laughs> Go ahead. Make my I speak French English. It's perfect. <laughs> now, is, uh, I have uh, two short questions. Why now is uh, drug is free? But everybody... Drug is free? Free, like marijuana is free. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but is marijuana free is free. Free to use. Free to use, free not yeah. free. That's <laughs> not free. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering uh, where I could buy it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, everybody worrying about kids, of course. Because uh, I go to every community and uh, at many school, because I do with news, small, small news. Uh, I have maybe make it one documentary about Canada, about the situation. Yeah. Is there many kids, I see the, like two issues before, uh, uh, my uh, friend is in Seawood uh, downtown, Toronto downtown, eight years old kid and take a drug and messed up. If you come, still have to be drug free for everybody or not? 
not criminal. And second one, second one, very important, please, if you can do it, something for everybody, for you, I mean, Ray, and for Canadian people, for Baltic people too. Wondering is, if you do, do go to around Canada everywhere, you see have to everywhere drug people and mental health people. Have the mental health problem. He's free. He's got to kill somewhere or people shooting. Have mental issues. Mental, yeah, mental issues. issues. And mental issues, you can give any, uh, like you can put a gel. You can say you have to sleep. 10 years, five years. Uh, after two, three months. Ask the question, please. What is yeah, the question? What the question? Uh, he go out. What is the question? Very important question. Just let me. I know. Yeah, but, yeah. 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 People are. People are waiting. Yeah, okay, but if you talk yeah, please. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And if you come, why people go to jail? No. Why people yeah. go to freedom? Normally, people, if mental people, have to go to hospital. Why don't 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 have this situation? If you be pre Mr. President, you have to change this issue for every Canadian people or not? Thank you. Thank you. First, first of all, uh, about the drugs, it's like I say it that way. <coughs> A conservative government would have never done what the liberals have been doing. Uh, I, I, I'm against uh, those vices, you know. And in Quebec, as you probably know, we have raised the age uh, to uh, buy uh, drugs that we consume at 21 years old. So uh, the first thing that the liberal government, uh, federal liberal government did is to say that we will go against that. You're not allowed to do that as a problem. I think it's, it's completely uh, the opposite that we should be doing because there's a lot of science saying that the, the brain is not little up until you are 21 at least, but maybe 24 years old. So trick, taking drugs under that age is very bad for people. So I, I don't understand why the state is having people, in, uh, helping people to go against their own health versus. So I think that that would be a good thing that we raise the age across Canada to 21 years old. First of all, by doing that is sending a strong message and then we can see what, how the society will evaluate around that. But it won't stop a, a kid of eight years old to have uh, did, did, uh, I've done what you, you were saying before. So I, I think we need to address it eventually. The counterpart of that, you're talking about mental health. Uh, we've seen that in the past, that we have taken the uh, <coughs> mental health people, uh, the, the, they were sick and they were thrown out of uh, institutions. We've seen that in many provinces. So I think, again, by giving more power to provinces who are in charge of the operations of the healthcare system, probably would be able to address the fact that some people shouldn't be on the street, they should be in ins institutions. And like I said before, I was involved with uh, food banks, but I was involved also with shelters that are having food banks in inside their walls, and it's incredible to to uh, to be uh, to see what is happening in, in those cities uh, when you see all of those people who are not fit to be on their own. And yeah, my last last question is about the immigration. Yes. As you know, there was a private sponsorship of the refugee, which is I think is issued by the Mr. Harper's administration. And the question is right now, there is at the moment like a group five. So group five just means uh, it's not going to government if five Canadian families supporting one people, so one person came from uh, abroad to Canada. It's not going to cost Canadian government even a penny. Those five families will support that. So at the moment, liberal is abolishing that. So and uh, it's free, so they are abolishing it. <laughs> so the, there's there's the certain conditions of the guys uh, approved by the by the United Nations, which is. Two percent people cannot do that, but the question is: is uh, at the moment, if you become prime minister tomorrow, are you reviving the private sponsorship refugee like a group five? I think it's a good, uh, a good situation if five families are taking care of one refugee. I'm an immigration consultant. That's why I'm asking. Yeah, I know. I know that you you understand that very well, and, and it makes a lot of sense. 
I think this is a good program that shouldn't be abolished, from what I, I understand. But at the same time, we have to di differentiate uh, the, uh, the refugees from the illegal immigrants. I think we have a major problem now with illegal immigration, and I'm not sure that uh, the refugees are receiving the, the good treatment that they would receive if they were taking into consideration as refugees. People that are coming illegally from the United States, I'm sure they're not refugees. They don't come from a uh, dictatorship country. They come from the uh, United States in taxi with their beliefs and all that. So we, we need to address those two uh, situations differently. But if real refugees are sponsored by families, I think it's a great program and it should be uh, reinforced. We have my vote. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for everyone for coming. Last one. Last, very, very last question. I, I have no intention to talk, but thank you very much for the opportunity. First of all, it's an honor to be in your present. And uh, second of all, thank you very much for uh, visiting us here in Kurdish House. And uh, as uh, we all realize, there is a lot of frustration going on among Kurdish people with the problems that we have. And most of the questions were regarding that uh, struggles that we are going through. Obviously, that frustration comes from uh, we have so many enemies. We, we have been attacked from many countries that are powerful, dictator, but never minded, but powerful. We have been uh, attacked and we have been killed for over 100 uh, years. And the frustration comes from that. You might have realized that all tension in the room is coming from that frustration, exactly. coming from that years of uh, carrying out without getting any help from uh, international government. And put most of the problems aside, one of the big problems that we are facing that I personally and most of Kurdish people believe that is an international problem is one that happened lately in the Sunjar uh, mountain that a lot of women, uh, uh, girls and children were taken uh, uh, by ISIS to put in the sex slave market and human trafficking. And I believe human trafficking is something international and every country has an uh, obligation to address that issue. And uh, my question is, do you see that problem as a Canadian problem, part of Canadian problem that needs to be addressed? We have so many issues in Kurdistan, I believe we want answer for that, but not from one person. But my question is, that uh, specific incident that happened uh, in Sinjar, and in general, do you see that problem, that ISIS problem, uh, that was one of the brutalities. Uh, do you see that as a Canadian problem that needs to be addressed? Uh, I think the human trafficking is larger than this particular situation, but it's also part of that. And we know that it, it happens in cities like uh, Canadian cities, you know. So it needs to be addressed worldwide, and Canada needs to be a leader into uh, this fight because uh, it's a major one. It, it goes to what we were saying before about <coughs> freedom of expression, freedom of uh, many ways uh, across the board because we are defending those values here. We have to prove that we can <coughs> have them respected, first of all, in our country, but I'll also defend that uh, in other countries like it, it happens in, uh, in this area. And I think denouncing it is al already starting to uh, Make sure that we will be uh, putting the energy and all the all our weight internationally uh, against this uh, big problem, major problem. Thank, thank you, you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Kaka. Uh, thank you so much, Richard. And thanks for everyone for coming here, for being here with us. Uh, you enlightened us about the new cause of the new leader of the Thank you very much for your presentation. Yeah, it's your time. Yeah. 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 for 40 years. I am and always will be 
Leona. Construction is one of the most stable industries in today's economy. There's plenty of opportunity, so come and learn at the Lyuna Local 183 Training Center. It's the right place to start. If you're thinking about your future, you can learn a skilled trade through hands-on training and classroom training. Lyuna Local 183 Training Center is excellent in training. All apprenticeship programs are registered with the Ontario Ministry of Training Colleges and Universities. Become an apprentice and learn new skills which will open the doors to a rewarding career. Visit 183training.com. I just started my training and I am Liuna. 